Okay, so this lecture is going to be on applications of induced EMF. So in the past, we have already looked at the idea that a changing magnetic field can create an electric field and that a changing electric field can create a magnetic field. And so this is really just going to focus on the things that we can find useful with those concepts and application-wise. So the first useful application of induced EMF is the idea of just motors. Okay, these are electrical motors. And essentially, this is something that's going to turn electrical energy into mechanical energy. And so what happens with a motor is that a coil is in the presence of an external magnetic field. So you have a coil that's in the presence of an external magnetic field, and then a current is run through the coil. And when a current is run through the coil, the coil creates its own magnetic field. So we'll say creating a secondary magnetic field. And what happens is those two magnetic fields are not lined up, so the coil will physically move to line up with the magnetic field. So the two magnetic fields oppose. Each other. And the coil will move to align itself with the first magnetic field. So this gets that initial coil, the initial movement of the coil. And then when we come back to class, I kind of need to have a picture to kind of walk you through, well, how does it keep spinning? Because if it just lines up with the magnetic field, it seems like if I had one magnetic field this way, and then all of a sudden my coil created magnetic field this way, it would move once to line up. Why does it keep moving with a motor? And it has to do with kind of a break in the coil. So we will look at modeling this more on Monday. Um, but this is the basic of it. You get this idea that you have a coil, it creates a magnetic field, and it's going to turn to line itself up with another magnetic field. Okay, so that's the basics of a motor. Motors convert electrical energy to mechanical energy with the help of magnets. DC motors are one type of motor and are often used in toys, appliances, and radio control cars or boats. In this simple motor, powered by a battery, the electrical current and magnetic fields make the motor's armature or rotor rotate continuously. To understand this better, we'll look closely at these forces and how they interact. First, we activate this circuit. While electrons actually run from negative to positive, the convention is to think of electricity going from positive to negative, so that's how we show it here. The charged particles in the electrical current create a magnetic field around them as they move, as shown by these blue arrows. Because the copper coil, that is the armature, is part of the circuit, the current also creates a magnetic field around the coil. By passing current through this coil, we've turned it into an electromagnet. As you can see from the way the magnetic field lines in the coil converge, this electromagnet has a north and a south pole, just like a permanent magnet. The electromagnet's field is represented here by a bar magnet. This isn't much of a motor yet though. An important piece, an external magnetic field, is missing. In our demonstration, this horseshoe magnet will provide that field 
as shown by these blue lines. We position the horseshoe magnet so that the rotor is right in the middle of the magnet's field. Let's power the circuit again and watch in slow motion what happens between the poles of that magnet. As soon as that current, represented by the red arrows, starts running through the armature, a magnetic field forms around it. Stopping the action for a moment, to take a closer look, we see that the field around the coil opposes the field of the horseshoe magnet. Using this bar magnet again to represent the field of the coil, we see here that the horseshoe's magnet's north pole is attracting the south pole of the electromagnet in the armature. In fact, these two magnetic fields oppose or attract each other at several points. Let's talk about how the design of a DC motor leverages these two forces into a machine that can do endless types of work. The current that runs into the armature passes first through one of these graphite brushes. Then through one of the two semicircles that make up what is called a commutator, which is a rotary electrical switch made of copper and featuring two gaps. The cleverly designed commutator is key to making the DC motor work. To see why, we'll temporarily replace it with this copper ring, which has no gaps. The bar magnet, again, represents the magnetic field generated in the coil. As you see, this is still not much of a motor. The interacting magnetic field caused the armature to move, but only to the point when their fields aligned north to south. And there they stayed, opposite attracting opposite, two magnets stuck together. Let's return the real commutator to its rightful place and see what happens now. Notice how one half of the commutator connects to one arm of the armature while the other half connects to the other arm. The current enters the first arm, making the coil spin. But this time, just as the commutator reaches the halfway point of its first cycle, a brush reaches the first gap. After jumping that gap and making contact with the other half of the commutator, it sends current through the other arm of the armature. As a result, current is sent through the coil in the opposite direction. This reverses the polarity of the electromagnet created by the powered armature. So once again, opposites attract, lights repel, and the armature turns another half rotation. As explained by Fleming's left-hand rule, the interaction of the magnetic fields will keep the rotor spinning and spinning for as long as there is current. Okay, so here's a basic DC motor. Um, I connect the positive and negative ends to a battery, and then this part of my motor can freely spin, the shaft can spin. And so you kind of see that that is just rotating around like crazy. So I want to show you kind of like what the inside of this looks like. So I have a one that I've taken apart here. So pretty similar. And with this one, I've actually, so this is the input and output for my leads there. And what I've got here on this side is just this metal part right here, just lightly touches that. Oh, it's really hard to see because it's kind of gunky. There's two little metal coils, not coil, two little metal strips there. Um, so that shaft is in contact. And if we look at the inside of this, and I can actually take this out. So inside of my motor, I've got magnets those are permanent magnets that are there and then i've got this coil system so i've got additional magnets here that are going to enhance the magnetic field um, that is generated by the current that's running through these coils and so as currents running through these coils a magnetic field is generated and the magnetic field is enhanced because of this external magnet here 
and that is going to be in the presence of this magnet inside, and we're going to have some repulsions and cause this thing to spin. Second uh, application is the opposite of a motor, and that is a generator. So a generator is going to take, um, it's a device that takes a mechanical energy and creates electrical energy. So it's going to be the opposite. So some external mechanism causes either a coil uh, or a magnet to rotate. It's a little wobbly. So some external mechanism causes either, let's say, a coil to rotate near a magnet or a magnet to rotate near a coil. Doesn't matter which one. Oh, I can't spell. To rotate near a coil. Either way, because of the fact that you get relative motion between the magnet and the coil, um, the coil is experiencing a changing magnetic field, and then a current will be induced in it. how we generate all of our electricity aside from solar power but um, something some external mechanism causes these giant turbines to spin so with wind energy it's pretty obvious wind causes the turbine to spin um, and actually causes the magnets to spin near a coil uh, with coal with nuclear with petroleum even with um, like thermal vents they basically cause huge amounts of steam to cause turbines to spin and that spinning causes the magnets to spin, which causes current to be generated. Okay. And even uh, hydroelectric water is causing the turbines to spin these magnets and it's gonna generate electricity in the coils. Okay. So that's a generator. Okay, so here's an example of an electric generator, pretty straightforward. I have to have some mechanism to convert my mechanical energy into electrical energy. So in this case, it's a push. So I've got this um, lever mechanism with some teeth on it, and it is going to engage this small little gear down here. Um, let me zoom in. And then that gear uh, is affixed to kind of like a bigger piece. And so that bigger piece here spins this little piece, and that little piece will then catch this sparkly thing. And that sparkly thing is actually a magnet. So by Engaging this lever, I cause the magnet to move, and that magnet is near two coils of wire. And so as I have a changing magnetic field, there is an induced current in these coils of wire, and those induced current go into these wires to then turn on this flashlight. Ooh. Okay, so that's one method of an electrical generator. Another example of an electric generator is just changing the mechanism by, oh, I've got a loose screw in there, um, by just changing the mechanism by which you crank. So in this one, um, like the mystery is inside here. So here's where I'm cranking this thing and it's causing inside a magnet to move. And as that magnet moves near a coil of wire, it causes electricity to run through there. And another example of, again, changing the mechanism is this flashlight, it's a shake flashlight. So you can see there's something inside there that's moving. And in that case, that's just a cylindrical magnet. So as that cylindrical magnet moves through the coil of wire, that coil of wire, there's electricity induced into that coil of wire. And in this one, it has um, kind of two functions. One, it can just go straight to the flashlight and turn it on. The other is there's this green cylinder here and that green, it's super hard to see. 
there's a green cylinder in there. Yeah, you can kind of that's a capacitor, and a capacitor is essentially a non-chemical battery. So this has the ability to store the electricity. So as electricity is generated, it gets stored in a capacitor, and that capacitor discharges, and we have the light on.